Hello everybody, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Anthony Blake. And as many of you know, we've done many talks over the years on the Gurdjieff work or Bennett systems and things like that. But today I thought I would, after many requests from other people, interrogate Tony to find out how did he meet Mr. Bennett, what happened while he was with Mr. Bennett and things like that. So Tony, that is going to be my first question. Thank you for talking to us. How did you meet John Godolphin Bennett? Okay, so this is a trip down memory lane. Um, but maybe it will illustrate some more general points beyond my particular uh, history, my, my life history. Yeah, I think I met him in 1960 um, and I was at university. I think I, yes, I started at Cambridge University then. And how did it happen? Well, in a sense, it began from that wonderful old institution, which is now, like many institutions, threatened, the public library. <laughs> Where many people meet and start wonderful relationships. Uh, they do. It, it's, it's an extraordinary place, the public library, and it's uh, a sheer manifestation of intelligence. And uh, so anyway, I there was the institution of the library, but also the institution of the bookshop. And in Bristol, I was living at the time, there's this wonderful bookshop called George's, which was right up near the university. And I used to pop in there. And I remember a certain period when I popped into George's and there was this book, All and Everything, my Gurdjieff, you see. And at that time, I couldn't afford to buy the book, so I used to go in and read bits in the bookshop. <laughs> this, that was my first introduction. And at that time, I was interested in all kinds of things. I was studying physics, I was interested in existentialism. And from that, I picked up on various trends which were going on. And there was a particular chap very famous at the time, Colin Wilson. You probably know about Colin Wilson, don't you? Yes, the, out, the author of The Outsider and many other books. <laughs> That's right. At the time he wrote The Outsider, it's weird. He was living in a tent on Hampstead Heath and used to go into British Library or something to, to write his book about The Outsider. And the idea about The Outsider, about looking at poets and contemporaries, 20th century and so on, he got from the other chap, Stuart Holroyd, uh, Holroyd who I um, eventually met also, and I used to talk with him, and they were part of what we call the metaphysical young men, as a, contrasted with the angry young men like Kenneth Tynan, and these metaphysical and very interesting trio of people. And anyway, there was that, and the outsider, and very picked up there, he talks about Gurdjieff and Ospensky, see, and what do you read? All these, these, these poets and philosophers were um, often suicidal or in breakdowns, and then he comes on to Gurdjieff and Svensky and say, oh, he portrayed them as having this kind of strength and coherence the artist didn't have. So, passing through the library, there was another factor which came to play, and that was a kind of intention which was to make my reading as chaotic as possible. That is not to get fixations. I mean, this is in complete context. What you get now with all these automated systems like Amazon, what they do is keep it, they pick up trends which you have, habits if you have, and reinforce them. <laughs> I was yeah. trying to do the opposite. Read something which will make no sense to me. This is what I wanted to do. Anyway, through all of this, eventually, um, found the dramatic universe. I've forgotten exactly how, and then Mr. Bennett and aware of him. And then I picked up his book concerning Subud. And I myself was in a kind of stressed psychological situation, an usual thing, contemplating suicide, 
feeling massively depressed and uh, seeking meaning and the rest of it, though I became attracted to this book on Subud or to the, what it represented. There was a chap actually doing some weird stuff somewhere. I remember seeing a little photograph in the book with Mr. Bennett and Pak Subu sitting on armchairs, gazing into space, so to speak. And I thought, ah, 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 I wonder what, who, what these characters are up to. And so eventually borrowed a few quid from my father, got my little suitcase, tiny little suitcase full of with sandwiches and a coffee of all and everything. By that time I'd bought the all and everything and went on the train down to Kingston upon Thames and met with Mr. Bennett. <sighs> Crazy. So you, you sort of went out on your little pilgrimage, but maybe you didn't realise what a pilgrimage it was at the time. Not really. Good. What, what could I know? I, I, there was... Well, the other thing which my friends mentioned there was I was looked into, as people do, I suppose they still do it, you know, um, are there people doing this stuff? Well, then of course you get go into a bookshop, you pick up certain books, you open them, you get little cards. <laughs> and this was the, I think it was, actually the Goethe for Svensky Society, or, some, or Society of Friends, it was sometimes called. Uh, one of those, I can't be too clear. And I got uh, a telephone number from that and phoned the guy up, he came to see me when I was in my home and so on. Um, my granddad suspected he was um, actually in, then into Scientology. <laughs> I met some of those other ones as well, and I was a little bit disappointed about all that. But I had this question, was well, problem in my mind about this portrayal of groups which you get in the literature, which I was beginning to pick up and read with Spensky and so on, because I was reading in Search and Miraculous while I was studying for my finals, you know, at, at, at the Bristol University. I gave myself an hour of study um, to be rewarded by an hour of, or reading a chapter of In Search, you see, so I could keep my studies up <laughs> at the same time, not be distracted. Yeah, but how to say it, the, um, I've thought about this portrayal of the groups, and this may come through in, in a later stages of our conversation, that um, I really didn't believe it would work as it's portrayed, you know, you're supposed to have people that come together somehow, and then you got a person who's a leader or more experienced, and they instruct that group, and then people in that group can go on and form their other groups and da 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 which is quite a common picture given of it because i didn't believe it would be existentially possible anyway so that was all this cloud of influences and you will realize yourself you know and from literature i mean the importance of people like herman hess and, and i really loved and music and painting and everything was in there but it was the, the quest so i went on from there and I probably have told in the previous interviews or something about the slightly humorous way I met up with Mr. Bennett. At that time, say it was 1960, Bennett was almost, how to say, um, just a lodger at Coombe Springs. He wasn't in charge of the place. The place had become devoted to this spiritual movement called Subud. So he wasn't in charge, but he was doing things because he could never just idle around, like writing his autobiography witness, which was a very big thing. And he was not teaching groups, doing movements or anything like that. And uh, so I thought, uh, well, the people in the house, and I got friends with some of these people in the house, and some of them, I'm going to tell you, were, um, in a way, nuts, you know. Had one of my close friends there, um, made at Kuma Springs, I still see him now, I can't remember his name, but um, he was in Subud and he'd had this state where God had taught him to jump out of a window and he'd done that and broken his legs. <laughs> oh, 
Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> the things that went on with Silverwood were uh, extraordinary. And um, I really liked this guy. And he used to do this. He lived in a hut in the grounds of um, Coon Springs, and he had a little what do you call it? A little small little stove. You do frying pan. He used it was always frying up fish. He lived on fried fish, and he did these crazy paintings that wish I had some of them now. And we got on like a house on fire. Well, that was the sort of ambience. But this first meeting with Ben went like this. I was there, and, and um, you know, the Bennett was in this place away from the big house, and he had a little house near the gates called the lodge. And but he did, I know, come up for his lunch to the big house. So it was almost comic book, not quite, but I'll put it this way I hid in the bushes. <laughs> Gosh, this sounds a bit ominous now, <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> Well, I was in a sense, well, I didn't actually hide in a bush, I was in a sense ambushing him because the poor guys came for his lunch. But I thought, but I didn't know how I could just get to talk to him directly, you see. And there was no procedure, and he was not the, in a sense, the guru anymore, or the, the, the main teacher. And uh, you know, just doing a bit of the background, the, the people running the place connected with Subud were seriously thinking of banning certain books, such as banning all and everything from the premises. <laughs> oh, wow, that's quite heavy. Oh, that's it was strange. heavy political scene. You see, it's, um, yeah, it was all part of my education in, in the Afghanistan. So anyway, I'm sure I must have told this. So I'm, you have I'm, told, I'm beginning to remember, but it's good for the audience. Cause, so you're lurking in the bushes, trying to okay. act, come out and... Oh, just bump into Mr. Bennett. <laughs> That's right. They come from the, Mr. Bennett. <laughs> and he was such a courteous man. He stopped. You know, so it's like brushing me aside and just, just stopped and sort of waited. And I said, well, um, I have a question for you. I said, I said what do you think? I said, uh, what is original sin? And I still say it with wonder reporting how on earth I had the gumption or the chutzpah or whatever it is or the madness to come up to a poor bloke waiting for his lunch and ask him about original sin I do not know but that was the first and of course the major impact and when he stopped internally as well and said you know, gave me an answer and that was unexpected and it was uh, to not do what you can do and to attempt to do what you cannot do here in the place and he stood off and I went. then i'm amazed that you was able to remember all that because if someone said that to me i'd be like the what the where the hell? Repeat that, please. <laughs> Was well, the point, Eddie, because it, it, for me it was, you know, as I was speaking to it, it was absolutely crystal clear. Mm -hmm. and, and that became, for me, a very important marker. You know, we've had this theme in our diversity uh, meetings of seeing. Um, but I was taking it, not a lot of people take this seeing in you know, like being in a state and awareness, having an emotion or something like this. It was never like this for me because I thought a true seeing was always totally articulate. It had the seeing is concerned with meaning, not with state. The state may come into it, but it's not the central thing with meaning. And so I always took it as my criterion. It's like probably comparable with how Gurdjieff writes in various ingredients he has, but one of them is his actual, his definitions and his laws and so on. He writes precise and is sometimes very ponderous way, but often it's, you can sense it is extremely accurate and precise. It's not just a, oh, it's sort of like this, you know, it's not kind of just an image. It actually, he, it's surprising because he always valued very much imagery and writing. He had this other side, which is the way of definition, which is totally verbal, you know, it required verbal exactitude and something. So there was that. Um, 
Oh yes, I remembered it very keenly. So that was the introduction, but then how did I get there? Well, two things happened, well, two stages in it, at least, and when I was, went to Cambridge for a postgraduate study, and because I was, had this burning question, why did what we call the, the new sciences arise in Europe when a certain historical period China, India, and Islam were far more advanced than Europe was. And it was really, it seemed strange where I had this thing, I learned physics and was attracted to it, and he said, why has it happened in Europe? And so I went to do the history and philosophy of science. And, and at that time, I had joined Subud in my hometown of Bristol. And I'll just do a little anecdote about that because it's, 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 it's typical. I can still see the place, the hall we went to. And the thing is with Subud, if you know anything about it, it's a, a way introduced from Indonesia by a man called Paksubu. And Bennett in his work with Borthway people and his connections has always been alert to uh, news about other things happening which might be related to his own search as a number of people were for the outcome. Miss Merston, for example, from Goethe would go and study with uh, and the sages of India. But, and there's this rumor about this, this guy and uh, and then went, brother, you know, you get, he got in touch actually with him and then it had this temperament, this style, you know, he ended up inviting um, Huxley to, to Coombe Springs. And this was a radical thing. So that you imagine that it would have uh, had quite an impact on his relationship to the Orthodox Gurdjieffians. Why? Because this Indonesian came up, out, and then it eventually saw him as an incarnation of Ashyata Shimash, the character in Beelzebub. And he wrote about this. And, uh, but it was a way very different from Gurdjieff in that it was based on really on the essence of Islam. You know, Islam means submission first and to submit to a spontaneous action. And to my mind, it's just really extraordinary that Bennett made that step. I mean, he was known, Coombe Springs and afterwards was like Mr. Effort. Yeah. And you might know that story from the the diarist, the idiots in Paris, about him, it's Gurdjieff in Paris, how Gurdjieff had almost begged Mr. Bennett not to work so hard. Because <laughs> Mr. Bennett was so eager, he wanted to know, he wanted to learn. But he'd also subject himself to, you know, do an exercise. He would do it ruthlessly, he had no mercy on it. It was an exercise very more as you got to do your arms out sideways and stare at a spot on the wall for an hour or something mad like that, you know, just to, and, and it was part of what Bennett became to understand. That also, Gurdjieff didn't originally understand it because he was used to dealing with Asiatics. And um, he didn't understand the kind of Anglo-Saxon Protestant mentality, which meant you, you say, I would do this, you actually do it. The Asiatics don't really bother. You know, kind of say, well, I'll sort of do it, you know, if I feel like it, kind of thing. But the Anglo-Saxon, I'll do it, I would do it, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Anyway, that's I'm distracting from all of that. Um, so this amazing spontaneous action, and that was, of course, the connection with that book concerning Subu, which I saw in the public library, and when the photograph of Mr. Bennett and Park Subu, Park Subu, I went to the to that place, and there. Well, I went to that place at the time when it had been running, and this was the end of that, that epoch. But there was then the period when I was at Cambridge, and it was to come 
been in Subud and then came with a few people in Subud, we do this. And I used to take the train down to Kingston and do the Latihan, as it's called, which is the exercise. And it was incredible because you have this, this Jami Shunatra, you know, know the words Jami Shunatra, don't you? <laughs> yeah, wonderful nine-sided temple. And we used to do it in there. And this place was a memorial to Gurdjieff that had been designed to display, perform the movements. A wonderful acoustics, really wonderful good for music and so on, absolutely wonderful. But we, and they had a very complex floor with a sunken pentagonal section, but they had to revise that because they'd have people doing this lucky hand on the floor. And probably can't picture it very well, but you have people spontaneously moving in all sorts of directions and having a floor like that would be dangerous. We just did all that, it used to come up. Then <clears throat> I was personally was then, see what I do as a career and I was around and I found there's a job offered in Australia and the university to teach science to some art students. I said, okay, and I, my interviews and did all that. Uh, and then just simply because my mother was so upset about me going away to Australia, I said I wouldn't go. Otherwise, my whole life would have been totally different. Yes, it would have been. You'd have been a teacher out on the southern hemisphere. Who knows what would have happened? Yeah, it's totally different. Who knows? You know, it's, a, it's a big what if. I, mm. I just did. And, and, um, but then I was in complete loss. And I was, well, I was in the period actually waiting to hear about the results of my interview and did I get the job? And uh, staying at home and feeling very depressed and staying at home, living off my parents. You know, it's, it's a common story now. And um, trying to hold myself together, and I said, see, agreeing with my mother, I wouldn't go. Then, about a week after that, thing with my mother, I learned I got the job. <laughs> oh no, so you, well, had you to, didn't accept it, obviously, but that you know, that, again, that's another trauma for you to have to go through really? with everything else that's happening. And I said, What do I do? I'm, you know, I'm, you know. No, I'm not a very practical man, I know. Who would employ me? Um, and what was available, I didn't know. So it somehow happened, I don't know, the warden, as he called it, did Coombe Springs, who was somebody like in charge of the running of the place and so on. And, and so there was, um, I don't know how he came to tell me, he wrote me, there was a, a job opening <laughs> as kitchen boy. Okay. Okay. And I didn't want to do so. I went down there, and it's getting comical. There I was, could you boy? I got one pound a week. But and you lived there, didn't you? I lived there. Right, yeah. Okay. So you got one first, pound a week. One pound a week, pocket money. That's all I had. And um, my first, first practical teacher was Lily Helstenius, a Norwegian lady, formidable lady, wonderful, wonderful woman. It was the dragon, you know, and she was completely queen of the kitchen and had to be done right. And so you can imagine me, my daily vista was this heaps of big pots because a lot of people around there and so on. So washing up was very much my forte and so on. Anyway, the story went on with all of that. And what happened next is that the, the was, was, was both political and personal. The political one was that um, there was this, as Bennett withdrew from Subud, he was in it for about four years, and he'd done this amazing positization for it, you know, traveled around, gave talks in like an American radio and so on. And then he felt it was, you know, uh, lacking in certain things. And he withdrew. Then there was a question about Coombe Springs itself. And so the politics of him re regaining control, so to speak, were a bit complicated at times. Okay. And you had to run through organizations and 
this um, procedures and had, had all the rest of it, but he did that. And the other was, uh, what about someone like me? Well, there was, with this turning about, uh, for Bennett, you know, actually regaining like control of Coon Springs as his headquarters. And he had acquired it during the Second World War, almost with a view towards having a place, but it at time was um, ostensibly for work by um, an organization run by the government to do with coal utilization and fuel efficiency. But after a year or so, he uh, bought it, or he and friends bought it, and there was an uh, excuse because one of his members of staff had been accused of being a communist, so that made the break clearer, and so he ended up with this. So there's all that background of him and the scientist he dealt with, and and how how creative he was in that in that realm, and. and of immense practical and managerial ability. And well, then he gathered around him this, I uh, can't call it a coterie, but it eventually became what I used to call one of my gang of fours. And there was a group of young scientists and a few others. Mm. And it was when he was doing something, as you always did, things which are really interesting and courageous. That is, he set up his place there, there in 1946, and under the auspices of this wonderful thing, Institute for the Comparative Study of History, Philosophy, and the Sciences Limited. And when I first said, uh, it was, the, 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 the old guards, so to speak, there said, oh, well, this was just a cover story, cover story. Could we want to do all this weird inner stuff, movements and exercises and da da da. So we didn't want the authorities to notice, so we make ourselves look academic, you see. So this is yeah, all. It would have been seen as weird, wouldn't it? The, the, the new age hadn't happened then. People would not perhaps have seen it as. That's um, true. As we would these days. Meditation? What the hell? Meditation? <laughs> You know, People sitting with trees. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, but he's had this change. You see, why? Because he'd had these, this, this very, and this is a complex thing, can only just indicate it, because Ben is a very complex character. Um, because he was a scientist as well as a mystic. And he'd had this urge in him which strongly emerged during the Second World War, where he was running this kind of um, research organization. And, but also, it was after 10 years when he'd been in London attending to Svenska's groups and all of that, um, he set himself on the path to writing his magnum opus, the, the, which became the dramatic universe in which I can only say, this is rather like Bennett's take on all and everything. Because he literally wanted to encompass everything. And as I read some of his diaries from that time, it's almost comical when he says, you know, I'm one, I can see I can embrace all the best of Western thinking and the system, as it was called, which is a good idea bring them together into one, I, and this would be the cat's whiskers. This would be the ultimate thing. So he's and not he creating was, a new system at all, is he? He's bringing forth what he's been learning over his years of you know, studying with Gurdjieff, studying other things. Oh, well, yes and no. Because it was called, I see this, Gurdjieff was called the system because that's what Spensky called it. And he really did believe in all those ideas, but it was he was making a quite new synthesis. He was, in particular, starting from this extraordinary point of um, being, what do you call it, actually a creative thinker in what concerns 
the fifth dimension. He was a proponent of the fifth dimension, and he was supposed to have written this paper about him when he was about 20 or something like that. And, and he had genetic history. I think there was a, he was the grandson of a mathematician called Cayley, an English mathematician. Anyway, he had that obsession with the fifth dimension, and it really drove through, and it was in some respects fired by Ospensky, but Bennett had it, I say, he, when he got the scholarship to Oxford to do mathematical physics at the age of 20 or something like that. And what had happened, oh, I have, there's a whole other story here, you see, that it was supposed to be um, that early work with his mathematics got fused with his inner experience, because when he was wounded, he had his out of the body experience, uh, which convinced him about the reality of the other dimensions. So he had, but he had the personal experience. And anyway, and all of this, blah, 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 blah. And um, so, even though he'd say that going back to the Institute, this was just a cover story. At one point, it, it surfaced all again. He'd, uh, and he was then, Okay, on complete going to complete his thematic universe has been in, in hiatus. He'd done volume one, volume two, now three, two more volumes to do. And so it was like, I he said, I take this seriously. And then he said, Gurdjieff meant his institute to be taken seriously because you know, Gurdjieff's institute never, in a sense, operated, it was just a manifesto. The Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man, you see, and I think, and he got the idea, it's just a legacy, and him and Spencer, he started to set up an imaginary institute, which never did anything. And, but, but no, no, we've got to do this. And so many things happen. And one of them was, you know, started the journal. Called Systematics. But he'd also, as he was always doing developing in his mind, and he developed this with us, with us young guys, this approach of systematics, which was to briefly take the example of Gurdjieff with his obsession with the law of three and the law of seven, and basically ask, why is uh, Gurdjieff so restrictive? Why only three and seven? Why not all the numbers? And so Gurdjieff followed that, which of course was another heresy because a lot of people following Gurdjieff say, oh, you must follow Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff says it's only the law of three and law of seven. It must be only the law of three and law of seven. Don't mess around with these other things. They're heresy. You don't do with those things. But he did, so there's that. But he started this, which was very important for me. Um, you know, you imagine me being, you know, again, I just, 21 or 22 or something like that, very young. There's a lot of guys who were, there's um, Tony Hodgson who'd been at university and Henry Bortoff to, was actually a PhD student with David Bohm. And then there was Ken Pledge who was, you know, taught in a college of technology. Mm. And uh, myself, that was a basic gang of four, and there were other interesting people like Simon Waitman, who eventually became head of religious studies in SOAS in London. And you know, Gilbert Edwards, who was ostensibly in charge of practical work, but he had you know, training in Jungian psychology and all the rest of it, and various other people. And uh, it was like, in a sense, something which is now being echoed in my setup, the diversity we have small number of people and we're following new ideas and researches and um, venturing into new fields and so on. So that meant um, how do I get out of it of being just a kitchen boy? Mm -hmm. So he did things like uh, setting up fellowships. So so Hodgson was the first research fellow, and I was the second research fellow. And this was a seminal influence on me because I don't know how it came about, but my subject matter was, was uh, small groups, the creativity in small groups. And that was a forerunner, what it came to years later in dialogue and so on, and, and all that kind of thing, but it was set up with that. And I did 
some educational work in Kingston Montaigne's College of Technology, as it was then, with, with small groups and the rest of it. Because we have from Bennett this attitude, you don't just sit around looking at your navel, you get into some enterprise, some research, something, innovate. You know, this is, you know, so this is a, just a prelude, but a long winded answer about how do I get in touch with Bennett, and then I stayed with him more or less, very checkered ways over about 14 years, and saw so many changes, I saw his contact with Idris Shah, uh, for example, and Shifuri Baba, and I saw the, the sort of completion of the Jamishu Natra, and then I witnessed also its destruction when when it gave away Kuma Springs and we entered another phase. That was being with Ben, it was, I was tell people it's a way of hazard, which he taught as a theoretical idea, but he also demonstrated in his life, you know. There's this um, it doesn't happen in straight lines. So this second phase that you've just uh, gone into, would that be what would then become Sherbourne House? Yes, well, that was that phase in this simple picture, you know, this phase of giving up Coombe Springs and what happened. And uh, then, you see, how did he come to do the Sherpin experiment? Yes, it was another different step because he'd given up Coombe Springs not with a view to doing Sherpin, but just the act of giving it up. I mean, this is what I call, this is the, the, the top way of, of hazard. You don't just do it with the, oh, I'm going to, I know what I'm going to do next. No, he actually, as far as I was aware, just jumped in the deep end. Stepped out into the void. The path of the void in a sense. And I thought, how on earth did he do it? Because he had he was running this place. He had a family. Um, it was a miracle. So his, he had kids then, they were, they were little children. Yes, they were. And, uh, so it's quite a risk to take when you've got a small uh, growing family. Oh yes. Yes, and you, you take, one takes one's hat off to Elizabeth, his wife, you know, what, what she must have put on, put up with. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the originally together while he was married to his second wife, Mrs. Beaumont, and who was much older than him. And, um, and she had her children with him then. And she was in a very difficult situation because of all of that. Um, that he needed, needed her very much. And uh, there he Did went, she, he had this. I was gonna say, you became very good friends with Elizabeth though, didn't you? Well, I sort of friends, but I was very curious with Elizabeth. I mean, one time I could say no, not because we had any antagonism, but we didn't really click at all. I remember the scene when she said, um, down at a large thing, go meet him there or do something. When he had this wonderful chair made from a big chair, which just suited his size. He was like about my height, but bigger around, you know, kind of thing. Sit, I used to go and sit on. He said, you know, Tony, you see them. You leave your presence in the chair just like Mr. Bennett does, but um, I don't know how to talk to you. <laughs> and we never, never had a rapport. We had some kind of rapport later on at Sherbourne because we, I, well, I take it myself, you can have different stories about it. I really was strongly with her about um, stopping the courses at Sherbourne, you know, cutting it off. Uh, which she was absolutely keen on, and I was too, for different reasons. But that's all part of the story. You see what happened. What's next? Uh, where should we go? You talked about the second phase. It, so they were. He was, and there was. Then you see it. He gone from this big. It was a lovely place. Oh, I must tell you the. Oh no, I was jumping the gun about this, the the Angelento story. Um, it was the 
we went into this sort of terraced house in the middle of King, Kingston on Thames, and I actually found lodging in a house nearby, which was um, owned by one of his followers, Kelt Lingard. And uh, there was also there the sister, Bryn Thring, who was the sister of, sorry, the sister of um, Meredith Thring, who was one of Venice Association associates during the war. But imagine a little coterie and people dotted around and they'd come and do um, exercises and have meetings. Uh, and uh, in the, the coach house, you know, little like in the suburban garden and kind of hardly any space at all. And uh, there we were doing all that, having on with any person. Time came when Bennett became ill, radically ill. I think it was, I don't know if I'm right, in terms of uric acid poisoning. And, um, and um, he was, says about it afterwards, uh, he had been come free of certain physical things in his practice, but then he had to be free of his mind because of the threat that this thing he had, which I may have given the wrong name to, would actually affect his mentation, his mind. And uh, it was probably only through the services of the doctor uh, the name I've just lose me at the moment. He was an inn in Harley Street and so on, but he became known to a lot of us, an Indian doctor, and uh, practiced homeopathy in a very strict and rigorous way, and had quite a practice in Harley Street, but um, presumably uh, saved Bennett's life in a way. And it was during this time that Bennett was considering his next steps, and uh, there had been, remember, all that period, you know, 10 years or something, it was 1960 to possibly to 1968, something like that, because 1968 is a very critical year, time of the kind of, um, well, flower power, revolutions, in France particularly, and of course the Dubček revolution in Prague, which Prague, which I made contact with uh, during that time. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, environmentally very, very dramatic time. And then it must have been considering what next? He was always a, after the next step, what's next? Is that because he would have finished what he was doing or because he felt he wasn't moving on in some way? Well, I wish I could do it and quote the actual poem. It's a lovely little poem by Goethe. It's about this constant unfolding, which was necessary to keep things real, and uh, it's, it's part of Goethe's concern with the being drawn on by the eternal feminine and so on. Uh, yeah, it was mm, way one can say he couldn't help it. He had this. I always had this sense of. Uh, incompleteness. Yeah. He never rested on his laurels, so to speak. He never thought, oh, I've got it now. And so he did a long time have this, and it's very difficult to sort out with him. This absolute faith in, in Gurdjieff and his teachings and so on, um, and uh, which, you know, later years more and more puzzled me. You know, and, and it, he went through something remarkable in this period when he was living in the town, the suburbs of uh, Kingston, and was connected with Idris Shah, and about, um, in a sense, beginning to get free of Gurdjieff. 
And there's a sort of contradictions here. And what I say just said just then maybe maybe question because what happened is that <coughs> you see there was for us this influence of what he was contacting. And I told you about the sort of network they was had what was going on in this world of avant-garde spirituality or whatever it is, and he would get notices of various people, including Idris Shah. And there was Idris Shah, who had um, a Scottish mother, and so he was tuned, even though he was technically an Afghan. And I met uh, a wonderful man, music pianist Henry Boyce, first played me of music, but he was jointly responsible for looking after Idrishar's father in, in the town of Bas, and so there's all that history behind things of Idrishar. And we had the romantic story, he was, his dad sent him to on a Victoria station in London with 10 pounds in his pocket to say, count, contact the people of the tradition or something like that in, in, in the West. Uh, <laughs> but Shah was quite a trickster and um, in some way, then it could really didn't understand him, didn't with him, because um, uh, Irisha was hip, really hip. He was um, he was a chick, I say, a joke, a joker, a trickster. Uh, he was very playful. I'm still remembering when he took over Coombe Springs and seeing him in the garden, pe pushing a wheelbarrow with a fag in his mouth, you know, yeah. and. An hour later, I saw him emerge from the main house dressed as an Indian prince. He could do this, play all these roles, you know, and entice yeah, all these. He could be all these different people. Because was at this time, would he have already done his B the shows for BBC that he was doing, or was this before then? Before then, because Idris Shah did programs with the BBC about. Yes, he did. See, he, he did one of these one pair of eyes that D'Angelo did, and. and <sighs> It was right, it was the same, you're quite right, the same BBC series, which I'd probably be great to see if we could get the whole series. And uh, but, they, but this was before then, was it? Or was this around the same time? Well, it was uh, around the same time. Around the same time, right, then, okay. But you see, Shah by then had done the thing, what he'd done was, you see, Shah got Coombs Rings in being a wog, which means a wily oriental gentleman, he had uh, sold it, and um, so he had the money, as he said, to set himself up as a squire in Anglia, I think it was. I don't know quite well, something like that. So he was there, and he was, had his own domain and so on, and that's why it was abandoned, and so to speak, and the Jami Shinatra was destroyed, which was a, a great shame and a great wrench for everybody. Uh, but Benny was cool, he said it was cool about the kind of thing. Uh, but I must then throw in this uh, story about Gian Talento and, and Coombs Springs. I just think it's one of the remarkable things. Was, um, it was in a period after when Benny was organizing Sherborn that um, um, Gian Talento turned up. Don't know how she got wind of it, but she got wind of it in one, and she was one of the first group to attend Sherborn. And she told this story. She was reading Bennett's autobiography called Witness you know, in her place, in her home, you see. And there was this photograph in this book which showed this wonderful oak tree, which was in the garden grounds of Coombe Springs. And she looked out of the window and there was the oak tree. <laughs> She said, my God, I'm where it all happened. You know? <laughs> I thought that was an amazing story. And then, uh, but anyway, she started, met her fleetingly a few times and she used to uh, pop in there at meetings in people's houses about what was being done at Sherborne and so on. And she'd come along to that. And, uh, and, uh, but I think that story about her getting there is amazing because that was, became interest Bennett a lot. You see, how how do people get get to a place like Sherborne? You see, it's not like um, well, I suppose it's well, I'm just thinking about 
modern marketing and advertising, which have become so prevalent, you know, in your days, so it was all a matter of like picking up by chance a book in a somewhere, you know, chatting to somebody on the bus. And that's how it it's happened. like proper synchronicity, isn't it? It's, it really yeah. feels like the gods are guiding you. Where now you just click online and search engine, boom, 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 up it comes. Where in them right. days you didn't have all that. And like you say, it was how do people get to these places? I've met people since that have you know, of your generation who've said they, they never knew where to go and look for things, but they always knew there was more to life than, to life than, you know, the rat right. race and everything. Yeah. So, you know, it is amazing Wonderful. that people do come together in them days. Isn't it? Um, yeah. I just, I think it's worthwhile reflecting. See, Ben wanted to make a study of all this, and it was, you know, he didn't couldn't find capable people around him to help him. And a lot of the source material, God knows where it's, it's gone now because he had quite a number of people write their story. And he wanted to write a book about it. And I've got the notes on the outline, but it's, he talked about life pattern. You know, you're very aware of this life pattern and all having this life pattern. And it works in the way the patterns work, which is not logically at all. Uh, it's not like, you say, looking things up or anything like this. It's just, it's, it's in you, it's a pattern, and you know, it's like, and the old banality said, or you know, you know, one's being attracts one's life, and this this kind of thing. And he wanted to do, explore this, and did, but he never got around to it. So there was that and going on, but you see, I don't know if he got to the, or you see all these influences I mean, in me. He trotted off to see the sheep, pretty barber, that's a whole other story there, uh, but. Slightly relevant to our conversation and, and our time now because I came back with the story of Hashi Puri Baba that, and this, I don't know when he went to meet him, it's in the 60s, and he said, Oh, in about 1970, something or other, two thirds of the world population would disappear. <laughs> and we all thought, That's nice. <laughs> and somebody sent him a question, What should we do about all this? And he said, Well, do your duty. And that's all he said. But it was, it was those young people there were just becoming blasé about this. All these spiritual types were going around prophesying disaster and doom, and we just got completely blasé about it, you know. And it was like, okay, okay, another one. <laughs> I was, yeah. Well, we passed that one. When's the next one coming up? You know, date of doom. <laughs> this kind of thing. Well, but isn't that um, like a, a selling point for these kind of people? to attract people as well, to make you feel like if you stay with them, you're going to get through the doom. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, even my father, if my father was in, mixed up with the evangelical movement in America and so on, and he actually said to me, I'm telling you, I'm going, when all this whatever hoo-ha happens, I'm going to be taken up into heaven amongst the elect. And right, this and the 144,000. <laughs> that's the thing which has gone on, you know. You think, oh, that, well, we see today all this this kind of machinery of, of creating ridiculous scenarios and cults and so on, which is still churning away there. But um, but I have that in as in my own story. It was very mattered to me very much what my father was got into when the time I was becoming uh, a very rigorous atheist. He was into this evangelical church and faith healing and and then there's a backstory about how I appreciated him in a way and uh, I was very, was very uh, struck by I had a couple of times of being with him in the church when he spoke in tongues you see which had quite an influence on me uh, but there's there's all of that uh, doing. How did I don't know if we got time for this because I'm rambling on and on, you know? Because it's um, it's want to convey this sense of um, the unknown and diversity. And uh, as perhaps unconsciously been emphasizing something taken from Arthur Kirstler, his book The Sleepwalkers. He thinks, you know, creative people in science had just no 
consciousness of what would come out of what they were discovering and sort of like sleepwalkers into discovery and so it was like us and uh, but we have this tension uh, of many kinds and mention at least one of them and that was to do with the dramatic universe and uh, it is uh, you know now became four fat tomes as we say uh, covering all and everything. It was Bennett's attempt at his all and everything to complement Gurdjieff's, I, I take it as. So it's got everything in it, science, art, supposedly, history, psychology, sociology, religion, prophecy. <coughs> oh, bang, shoot, anything you could think of, he's, he's slung into it, kind of thing. He's like he's known as um, the modern Renaissance man, you know, doing Back to the time when people did that automatically and for me it was um completely as it should be because i i can never understand i was born in the sciences but i just spontaneously just adored art especially modern art and music i thought this is completely natural and i found people just mostly stereotypes you know just say yeah very yes it is that. and that does seem to still be going on to this day there is <laughs> stereotypes out there and then there's just and there's just, thankfully, people that don't want to be stereotyped. We don't want to be kept in boxes. We want to try and look at everything, mm. you know, the all and everything, everything. <laughs> like you were saying earlier about Amazon always sends you the books, recommendations of the genres you like. That's, That's people right. People feel safe and secure, don't they? But That's right. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Bennett sad. didn't want to be safe and secure. He wanted to test the waters and see what else is out there like you and I like to think myself like to think like that as well we want to see everything <laughs> and everything's connected <laughs> now I have to quote the famous Gurdjieff aphorisms which you know very well but it was like any excuse to cook them you know? of course they're always good to hear again and, and to even... remind people of them and I need reminding of them sometimes sometimes I forget them or, or what the essence of them is. So yeah. to hear them again is always good. And it's part of our work together is just maybe low level work, whatever it is, basically just reminding us each other of the, the principles and so on, because the rule is we forget. It drifts away. Okay. I just mind you too about our friend Jesai in theatre, and he I got him to actually do get people to sing these aphorisms and a kind of canon anyway here we go it's first found in the book by not on journals of a pupil i love it to know means to know all not to know all means not to know in order to know all it is only necessary to know a little but in order to know this little, it is first necessary to know pretty much. Genius. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. So that was axiom, axiomatic. And, and we, in the sense of um, him, you see, of um, two things of, uh, well, they come together. I wanted to show how it was. One was this tone style you see, of service which he emphasized over and over again he was very much against people as say navel gazing being concerned with their own states and so on he said oh, no, had many insights into practical pillars you know the pillars of islam pillars of the work and one was this um service which was came reflection of his understanding of good called conscious labor and intentional suffering conscious labor was service um, which entailed this intentional suffering um, and so he was came fascinated in various projects particularly education and uh, so we as you know and there's a whole other story I go into or i still think he was an amazing guy you know how he invented this teaching system and a teaching machine you know imagine a natural apparatus come out of his, the work ideas there it was <laughs> and he did it with in collaboration with the eec the general electric uh, company in england uh, 
and uh, worked with some of their scientists there. And they're, they're, he was like that. It was service. You had to be uh, you know, creating something meaningful and doing something in society uh, you know, for the, the helping of the community you live in. And he made this almost axiomatic for us. One did this. Um, I think it's very important to realize because it was, uh, I think there's always a, and this is right, but I take, I'll say it, a kind of protection. You see, if you just get the psychological group being psychological, it um, it's kind of inverts in a way. It, it is, what I've seen is it's not healthy. You, you've got to engage out of the world, and I've made that almost a standard law, whatever it is. Of, my understanding of, of being fruitful in this way. You've got to find a way of bringing something into the community around you. And not only to the people you work with, but actually the larger community and so on. So education was a big part of this. So we you know, ended up with uh, me and a few others taking trips to America and engaging with people like Oh, what is it there? Yeah. Uh, Engaging with people like who? I lost that. Yes, I'm, good. I'm just thinking about well, because oh, well, you know, sorry. I'm oh. on the, it was it, um, who was the main uh, computer uh, company in England now? What is it? The, uh, and, uh, well, I've forgotten the names. Actually, which is, you know, fear of my old age and this kind of thing. But there's one, you know, a couple of companies and also one in England. And they were, had set up educational departments. Why? Because the federal government in America then was freaked out about Sputnik and we wanted to improve education. So we're pouring funds. And so all the rich companies, of course, got the greedy hands on all the funds they could. And then they have no idea what to do about it. But then we had something to sell them. And strange things happen. I end up doing teaching materials for the Naval Academy at Indianapolis. Uh, I think it's Indianapolis. Uh, you know, it's, um, well, it's, we'll call it the Naval Academy in, in America. Can you imagine me in the middle of the Naval Academy in America uh, doing this weird stuff with them? So there was all of that. All right. um, um, and, but the other side, more subtly, is he always had this tension in him. Because things like the Maginubis, in a way, are a tough read. Mm. And it's... Uh, uh, you have to be if you're bringing in new ideas and new, new ways. <laughs> or you know, expanding people's way of thinking. If you imagine, you know, it's been a secular time. You call, if you call the Maginubis a spiritually based book, you know, not many have a mathematical appendix in them. <laughs> 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 We've got to know tensor calculus, you know. It, it's, it's just, um, so it made a sort of divide, and it was very interesting sociologically because the divide was between people who, like me, me and Hodge and Bordhoff and so on, could kind of relate to the magic universe because we knew science and philosophy and that kind of thing. And, and the general membership, and he was very much aware of having to deal with this. He used to create something which the only membership could partake in and not restricted to those who could read the dramatic universe. Um, this was, uh, then comes to some possibly still unanswered questions in um, respect of the design of his course at Sherborne, for which I will tell you my usual stories in a moment. But how are we doing, Debbie? This is too much, too little? No, this is great. We, we've done an hour. So should we, should we go on to your Sherborne stories? Okay, if, if you're not too tired. And, no, no, let's do, let's do them. And then, because we can always I'm, do another show on this. We don't have to just do it all in one go. Okay. It's, uh, as you see, it's quite a kind of complex set of material. And you know, it's mm. not, this is my story. It's not the story, it's my story. <laughs> yes. 
Mm. Yours is mm. one side of a, a many people's lives. Because yeah. I was going to ask you, was there many people there? Are we talking like on average a day? Is it 30, 40 people, 100 people? Talking about where, which one? Sherborne. Like Sherborne. There was, there was 100 people. 100 people. Yeah, and you have to take a, a yearly intake of 100 people. Can you imagine? Mm. Well, they were split into three groups, roughly. And um, there was a cycle. At Kuma Springs, it, there was there's people living there at different times, and of course, about I don't know, 20, 30, something. And uh, then there were summer schools and seminars, and more people came in. And sort of, um, when we had a, you know, like a, a summer school, and people came in, and the residents, like me and other people, had to leave the uh, Kuma Springs and then sort of pretend to come back in as if we were freshly coming in. <laughs> And we shouldn't act as residents, you know, uh, to be newcomers like the yeah. other people. The freshers. <laughs> freshers, that's right, yeah, that kind of thing. All right, so. I'm just going to turn the light on because it's getting dark here. Oh, I might do that too. Is that what this? Right, hopefully um, that's better. Memory, stories. I forget that it's getting darker now earlier in the day. Yeah, isn't it horrible? Yeah. That's, oh, I hate nice. it. I'm into it. like 40 minutes. Or yeah, that old poem by Ezra Pound, instead of summer is a coming in, he says, Winter is a coming in, loudly sing, Goddamn, 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 Goddamn. Goddamn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Oh, you're right on, Ezra. Yeah, this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> there was, you see, now the story with Sherburn and myself is. Slightly dramatic, because um, I was, you know, this this period when after Cooper Springs, you know, I was, um, what was I doing? I was looking for my own sense of meaning. I was, uh, you know, I had as a student in Bristol, I had this amazing input just to getting to know about Bennett from David Bohm, who I've had these unparalleled conversations with, you know, as a age of 20, walking in the streets of Bristol, talking about everything and so on, and many stories about that. And then later on, if you like Edward Matchett, this incredible man who uh, taught creative design and genius and so on. And uh, I had he was a man who lived in Bristol. I connected him through Bennett because he, Ted Matches, had written to Bennett, and Bennett had sort of put me onto him. We became lifelong friends. But there was some unknown story connected with them because there was only saw, heard Ted's story about him talking to Bennett about things, and he claimed that Bennett started screaming and shouting at him and pounding the desk. And uh, so God knows what went on between them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he must have pushed Bennett's buttons for him to be like that, surely. Oh, yeah, yeah, and uh, because you see, there is this side of um, I don't know, conflict, controversy, and so on. I remember with, with the David Bohm, that's two year period, and I was privy to their conversations. And I put that into my book about the uh, correspondence between the two of them, which I have luckily had records of because I thought so because I it's a horrible story. I lost all the cards ones I personally had with with with, with Bohm. And it was just that you you get a certain rigidity and fracturing happening. You know, the, the, those two men couldn't really wear each other's shoes, if you like. They had to remain you know, powerful intellectuals in their own right, in their own way, and and uh, and so it, so it is. Uh, there are these things, and then maybe they're, well, they're part of the story and the and the essence of it. But anyway, in this period, I was looking various ways, and um, I was uh, since the period when Ben was still running groups in uh, Kingston, and I think I had to. I got into the state of uh, saying, you know. 
what's going on? What are these for? Where are they going? I couldn't see them going anywhere. Uh, and so I can't put a date on it, I must say. But you were partaking in the groups, were you? Oh, both, yes, then. Right. But then the point reached, I said, no, I'm not doing it anymore. Because I, I do not understand why. And it was a very similar moment for me because most people go on in groups, whatever they're doing, simply because they're going on. And they very rarely, I claim, stop to ask why and what's really happening. You know, it's very interesting. A book that um, Ken Pledge put together, Transformation, marvelous group about basic methods and so on, urged people to do, and people never do. He said, You're in a group of, they say, about after few years at least, you've got to sit down and say, well, where is it going? Is it providing anything? You know? And not just carry on. This is, I, I hate it. I see everywhere, just people just carry on. Well, people it, do, never. don't they? Again, it's coming down to they feel safe and secure that everything's repeating itself every week, even though we think we're doing the right thing, rather exactly. than branching out and going on to the next stage. Age. Next stage. And see, I'm doing my example of Bennett. It's not as if you know where to go. You've got to actually leave where you are and not be like that character, if I may allow to involve literature in this sense, you know, we close the eight clocks and start to play when they're in hell, a man, his wife and his mistress, and they're screaming at him, driving each other crazy. And he says, let me out, let me out. And the door actually opens for him. And he goes out into this corridor and then goes back inside and closes the door because he said, it might be worse out there. <laughs> You have to take that risk. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know. And you see, the man is uh, yeah, sort of Bennett man, I just, I don't care. <clears throat> the unknown, it's the unknown. You go out, you see. No, don't. We have to go into the void. <laughs> That's right. So I felt in a void, you know, because everybody else was going to the group, I wasn't. And I didn't go out. Because it's just, you know, it's a subjective personal experience but I, uh, for me it was seminal because you've got to do it unless you because in a way put a crew it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong it really doesn't matter you just make your own decision that's what matters you know just being part of a group and i'll cite you my one of my maxims which i bore everybody with i think that's absolutely true if you join a group you lose half your will Uh, people just think I'm making a joke or exaggerated, but it's not, it's not. You can still join a group to learn something, to initiate something, but only for a time. But that's another secret of the work, you see, only for a time. Continuing things is stupido. It means you've got to face yourself with this challenge. Anyway, so, I... I was in, sorry, involved in various things, and I, and, uh, I don't know what the actual time is, and sitting up and going there and leaving Kingston and all the rest of it was, but um, I was uh, quite determined not to go to Sherborne myself. I thought, what's the point, you know? Are you going to teach all this stuff again? And, uh, but then, kind of message came through from Bennett through some other people to me that he, that message, I ought to go to Sherborne, which I had to deal with in the details of it, um, neither here nor there, but suffice it to say that uh, he, uh, put some pressure on me um, to do this. And I didn't want to go. Do you think he sensed that? And that's why he was pushing you more? Well, of course, because I said, no, no I'm not going. I want to right. go. Kind of thing. Uh, but, and of course, it, well, it built up and there was emotion and God knows what other influences, but it was a very interesting moment, the date I can't be quite sure of, but I met him in London and it was 
one of these unknown things I still don't know about resolve. He talked about being attacked by evil forces, um, which scared the bejesus out of me. Mm. What, did he mean psychically or just, fit, you know, the dark forces were trying to stop him doing his work? I don't, I don't know. know. Okay. You go into details, you see it in his... Uh, and, and why did it scare the bejesus out of you? I thought if you really get committed to this stuff, you're going to get bloody exposed, you see. You're not going to hide. It's not a hiding point. It's the obviously reverse. Uh, it's a taking a risk again, you know. And I think it's all... It's not all lovey-dovey. No, it's not. Mm, this is what one thing that annoys me about the new age, though I suppose it brings people in, but the new age is too lovey-dovey and they don't realise there's more. This, it's, it's two <laughs> things. It's not just lovey-dovey. There is a dark side. The dark side is... Must be faced. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. The, the dark side needs to be faced, doesn't it? Yes, I didn't want to face it. I'd had... Um... I guess it's seminal, you know, because it, it's so awkward this story because of so as much as my just subjective experience, whatever it is that I remember, I sometimes did walk in the streets of Bristol and pondering what it was, and um, and in a way, I, I had one of the sort of, you call it visions, for the kind of what I call intellectual visions, but some people would discount them as visions at all. But I saw. The um, it was like the holy people in cities, and it was both the angels and the holy people. And I could see that they were in this world which they had to obey the will of God, they had to. It's called in Islam Jabarut, I think it is. Um, I guess it was excruciating to see this, absolutely excruciating. Yeah. Seemed they had no choice, and it was they had to go that way. So that was imprinted in me. You don't know why. Why do you, you've had experiences? You things go on, and they call it. I call it an imprint. Comes in, and it's like chunk, chunk, chunk. And see why? Because the world of why and what for is just um, the shallow world. We don't know the other one. We don't quite know how to find a way. And so there was that. And so when I met with him, I did then say, okay, I've been overcome. With, sorry, do you want to interrupt? For a moment, I'm just recording now. Well, we just had a, a little blip, so Tony's back. I did. That was a bit of this amazing time, and it's like a way to share it because it's um, not because I'm shy about it, but oh, I don't know, maybe it spoils things, but I guess it's the only. I tell you it's so important to me, it's the only time ever I embraced him. Wow, okay, so you knew you were drawn. <clears throat> I just, and I, then I said I would come, and go and do it. I did uh, join the enterprise and I saw it and then, you know, here I am rummaging through my little kit bag of anecdotes and uh, my favorites and one of them is of course in the in the first year which is a show which i was not going to show myself i had some contact with it in two ways one i was uh, i did theater there with the people because i'd run a group in kingston which involved this advisor from Rada, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and so on. I was exploring this and doing experiments with all of that. And uh, so I got, and then at running Sherborne would invite guest speakers, you know, from the people he knew to come and give new inputs. And so I was one of those, so I did that. And um, there's also the time in that year when this other side to his, all this enterprise came in, that's the people from the Biosphere Project or what became, what became the Biosphere Project before there was Biosphere Project came down with a theater of all possibilities and they did something, so I was connected with them. And, uh, but then I had this conversation with him, in which I'd come 
and he showed me around, so to speak, and he said, well, tell me what you think of all this, and I was, of course, very respectful, and I said, oh, I said, well, I think it's amazing how much you've done in so short a time, because he was like throwing the book at them, exercises and movements and lectures and practical work and everything, so to speak, in there. And the little Ben aside, he said, yes, but, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't care. So he had no master plan, which maybe is the best way. <laughs> Absolutely, as I said. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> you know, the, anyway, so I, I got into that. And it was, it was just, he was so practical in many ways. And a lot of people were amused because we had, it was like at a school, and children had been at school before, it had a timetable, you know, with all the sessions worked out on the timetable and people were amused at this the kind of good jeff and fourth way schooling got the timetable well but then uh, things were divided and so you had one group concentrating on movements one group looking after the house and one group um, not quite sure what sort of group was doing well uh, um, and uh, all these strange things the psychological group run by I um well, Dick Holland as was my name I can't remember anything. He went along to it, you'd be absolutely puzzled because all he did was talk about the French Revolution. <laughs> I still didn't say I loved the guy. I really everybody loved him, you know, going to be just he was obsessed I, with that part of history for some reason. Some reason. Well, Many things you see. One thing, sorry thing to realize, and he said at Sherborne, is how little help Bennett had. You see, at, um, so at that time, for example, he'd, um, person he worked with initially with the movement, Joan had um, become secretary to the Idris Shah. You see, so she'd left, as you say. But then he had. Uh, The, this young man, Michael Sutton, who joined him early, who was uh, at Sherborne, was in charge of catering. But, uh, sorry, because, I think she's falling off my thing, but yep, sorry. I don't know if you heard that, but this glass just popped off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was in catering, but he was also absolutely masterly at, at the movements, and he had this extraordinary woman, Anna Durko, there teaching movements, and he had and chap this Gilbert Edwards was looking at practical work. He had a, an accountant. Um, and that was about it. You see, and Elizabeth, of course. Um, and you had to do things you can knock the place into shape and run all the all the events and so on. Later on, Pierre Elliott uh, joined in, and various other people joined in, like myself. Well, at the time, so a little help. It was just like, um, he, and also, you just see the money for buying it had come from this wonderful Norwegian lady, Helsinia. She sold a house in Kingston. That was the money which was invested into Sherborne. So it was done, I don't know, it was like um, on a shoestring. Kind of thing, that sort of feeling too, which was which was very good. But then, the, um, I Everyone had the one came together, didn't they? You all work together to make it work, even though it's done on a shoestring. I'm not saying oh, yes. monetary, but the people were working as a community together. Oh yes, so it was taken for granted. It was, but you know, we needed this. Um, how do you say the specialities, the specialities, you know, look after things and know how to do things and all that sort of thing. The staff, you know, you some staff. Um, but it was all done around the people themselves, and so you mended the house, cooked, whatever it was. Um, and uh, just hear the flow of memories come in. And it was in the second year, I mean, after that, when I, you know, 
really had no contact at all. I didn't go to Shogun at all. I was keeping away from it, and it's only then I went through this process, and then the third year I was there and met people, and they're so interesting people I was there with, including George Bennett, um, and his son, and um, Anne Hilliard, so on. Uh, ever after, you know, we, we are intimately connected in our hearts you know, from this. It doesn't matter what we think or feel or do, it just, just it was there. And other people remarked about the um, being power, being being with people in that event, and uh, used to meet people in later years. They, they treat it as the peak experience of their life. You know? But I ha had all my questions about the uh, what was it for. Then it um, really ended up with with. I'm going to sort of pumping up all these people. I mean, they were full of stuff. They had the movements, they had the exercises, they had all the lectures and the triads and all of it. And he said, well, let's go out and multiply. <laughs> <laughs> Spread the word. But you see, the word, yes, which is what, you know, Gurdjieff wanted as well, wasn't it? But it never works. It never, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that. Anyway, it doesn't quite work. Yeah. But now here's the other story. Uh, I can pause, you see, every time I talk about these things, it's like having to sort of re-weave re the tapestry. In Ulysses, when I said Penelope uh, has to undo all, all she's done, and I said she has to do it again because when it's completed, she has to choose a suitor and this kind of thing. Anyway. She's waiting for her husband to come back. <laughs> that's right, that's right, you see. And, uh, but Ben is one of the great motifs in his life and his search on it. Oh, it's one of these things he's always had, I don't know, always, but long time, was community. Mm. Setting up a community. And he was, you know, he tried to do this in various ways, he tried to be, he actually had this idea in 1947, 48, of doing it in South Africa. Because um, he knew a few people there who had farms and so on. And, said, Why not? and he was, like many people, connected with the work, and many Europeans as such were convinced that Europe was shot. <clears throat> and they were concerned with building an ark to save what was of value in mankind from the flood of chaos and disintegration. But it was just amazing how, you see, everyone has their limits. And so I read his diaries of being in South Africa and I could see here, seemed to show no awareness of the black population and their interests. Um, um, and he spoke to the leader there, an extraordinary man called Smuts, who was not just a political leader in South Africa, but also a philosopher, and, he, and Smuts had produced a kind of equivalent of any systematics, and independently he knew about holistic thinking and so on. And Smuts just smiled when Bennett talked about his thought about moving to South Africa and said, you, you, you don't know what the situation really is here. And uh, so Bennett gave that up. But he'd hoped then that um, Coombe Springs would become a place but it just wouldn't work. He thought it wouldn't work. I don't quite know why, but he said it didn't work. You could do things to having groups and seminars, but this sense of community, ah, no, no. Forceway community. He gave these talks about it, needs of a new age community, which I, I myself didn't like at all, even though I edited the book, because I thought he didn't have a grounding in the work which had been done with intentional communities, physically in America. He didn't know enough. And what did he do at the end of his life, just a few months before he died? He signed the contract for Claymont, another 
part of our saga in West Virginia. Uh, and I remember being in the meeting and declared that, and I myself, I went, uh-oh. <laughs> then to most people's well, dismay, you know, he died very shortly after us. And so that momentum was there of this place or an investment, what was going to happen, who's going to be in charge, but that's another story. And those people were there you know, often absolutely violently, valiantly struggled on with doing something with the community, but it was founded around a whole cluster of things which Bennett, you know, he was so versatile, so widespread. He was into this sustainable community, sustainable living, alternative technology. Um, and he kept passionately this. So a number of people who left here, one who sort of went out and bought some kind of farm, farmstead. You know, had to, had, to, had to grow your own vegetables and do it. And that was all. Grow your, you had, they had grow your own vegetables and uh, follow the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I thought this was a bit too demanding. Yeah. There's a sort of thing I would have liked, actually, and, and I've said to people since, especially since we're in 2020, we should have done this kind of thing years ago just to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> well, people. I have tried, and there's quite a tradition in America at the time, and there's an interesting book I mentioned, which is about a study of intentional communities in America, including one which a chap there, which he spent about six weeks with this group connected with John Allen and the Biosphere, two people who were one of the groups very deeply affiliated to Bennett um, and his ideas, and even though in their public activities is hardly ever come to the surface. It's like that recently, very early, a guy made a film called The Planet Earth about the Biosphere 2 community and um, the history. It's a pretty even-handed account because the, the whole thing was weaved in controversy at one point. And they, it amused me to see in part of the archive footage they use to John Allen giving a lecture, and there would be diagrams on the board which were actually taken from Bennett. <laughs> because in the film, he's never mentioned. Bennett never mm -hmm. mentioned. If you get that. And I might have told you my little contribution, but I, I say, my kids said, oh, I, I planted two banana trees in Biosphere 2, you see, and I also co um, produced and edited the first book about the Biosphere 2 project. Uh, that is, I had this involvement in it, but it uh, it's very interesting to see this side connected with Bennett of manifestation. I see, I, I really cheered my friends in the wire, so they actually built this bloody thing, with fantastic engineering. And he got into all kinds of hatred and trouble because of it, because they went outside the box completely. And yeah, it didn't were, fit uh, in with the materialistic world that, you know, the materialistic people yeah. are trying to grow. <laughs> yeah, you know that um, when they got thrown off the project, you know, with UK marshals, armed UK marshals, actually with guns out, uh, booted them off the project. And... Uh, then they had to go in all manner of court cases, which were actually mostly engineered by some guy, I've forgotten his name, who's actually a pal of um, Trump, you know, it's that sort of regime they came from. Anyway, let's not look at all that negativity, this uh, sense of the biosphere and, and it's, it's manifestation. And I made one contribution, I took, I've got this, you know, this head of Gurdjieff and it was inside the biosphere for the original lockdown, you know, two years living there completely. But that side of what was connected with Benny impressed me a lot and how his work during the war has so to do with few utilizations. So he knew practical science. He knew about managing creative people. Um, he knew, knew about the needs of, of the community and this kind of thing. And his, his, 
universality of being able to accommodate also East and West. In that time, I initially started talking about when he was in the 20s and so on, and he was, um, it was centered on mathematical physics as far as I could see. That was what he was going to study after. Then he was wounded, he had this experience, and according to what I think George Tumay and Elizabeth said, that he'd um, was claimed that after being wounded, a different person came into him. and this person had an attraction towards the East. And I read a bit about one of his, in one of his diaries about this. He actually has his calling. That's why it led him to Turkey. And at that time, he didn't know languages. He just, because he wanted to get to, he taught himself Turkish. And he became a polyglot. But initially, he just didn't know. that He wanted to go East. It was like a calling for him and all that kind of thing. And so he knows started with this incredible state of a marriaging between East and West. And so he could really understand another of his aphorisms of Gurdjieff, you know, this wonderful one, take the wisdom of the East and the knowledge of the West, then search. A wonderful triad, you see. And um, I was sort of pointing out how Gurdjieff appreciated the knowledge of the West. You know, the East in some respects, it's ignorant. Uh, much as he extolled his virtues, you see. So he had that, and he had that, but he had that tension. There was a science. He thought he could, and he still has felt it, make it as a scientist, and he wrote up his ideas on the fifth dimension, and he had, I think it was Max Born, I'm not sure, he got to read it and come to Coombe Springs, as he felt it would make such an impact on science as to change thinking, but it didn't because it was largely rejected. And so he's left with that longing, you see, for to do something really scientific, which is always haunted, I think, people connected with the work and something I get tense about because it's, uh, I want to say science is science, it appears proceeds by questioning and observing and experimenting, calculating and communicating. And this whole idea of having some sort of secret knowledge somewhere just doesn't make any sense to me. It just it can't work like that. It sounds works by cooperation and interaction and transparency and so on. And there's, there's this wonderful book by Marsha called Roots of Civilization about Paleolithic time, you know, verifies that he had that to be a scientist to make it in science but also this um, practicality and he was mm, well crude terms an, an optimist <laughs> he was always had amazing face in the end and I think it was um, I don't know maybe dragging this part in but it's going back to Subud and what the other component which came into his life was and upset many people. He was always doing things which upset people. He went and joined the Catholic Church. And people went, what the hell is he doing now? <laughs> Why he is he doing... in, in his last, um, I think it was the last few years of his life. No, no, that. no, it was no, no, it was way back in 1960. Oh, was it? Um, oh. Oh, yeah. He was, but uh, isn't it because he understood the Christ energy? That was why he did it. No, it it he that developed with him. A lot is in his uh, biography. I mean, where it, it was the connection with Subud. He had this extraordinary connection with the Benedictine monks in Saint Andre in France. He used to visit them. That's when he had. What might, might be in your mind the experience, you know, he was with the chapel and the Easter, and they carried the host past him, and for him it was said, this is the body of Christ. That was, for those who don't share that attitude, it sounds like crazy belief to have, you know, brainstorms, and for him it was absolutely literal. This is the body of Christ, and that made him except going into the Catholic Church, because that's the critical moment about the real 
thing. But he knew he had this background. He said, I just thinking talking to you about this. Um, you know, you just inherited this saying which he had us pronounce after doing movements, you know, and all the sweat and so on, and we'd have to say to him, May these, the results of my labors, labors be transubstantiated in me for my being. Sublime expression, but it's also transubstantiate, which comes, of course, in the Christian tradition, is where you change the actual substance of the host into the body of Christ. And it's, it's a sheer magic, superstition. Okay, well, he did that. And it's, surely it's not superstition, it's something that we're trying to be working towards, is to transubstantiate <laughs> ourselves into that's right. finer that's energies. That is, that is right. That is right. So you see, you see, it's, well, I think myself and people attach the word now mostly to Sufism and Islam, which is quite understandable, but I'm, I'm attached myself to attaching it to Christianity. I mean, one time God just said it's esoteric Christianity, but he says different things at different times. And I think there's something having to do with the triad, the threeness, or in the transubstantiation. Um, it really resonates with the work and the, um, well, how it goes through, not only Bennett, but of course, Morris Nicole, uh, very, very, um, the new man and so on, the mark and so on, steeped into the, the Gospels and how important the New Testament was in, for the people of that period, no longer because we're now into Tibetan Buddhism and Sufism and that sort of thing, but it's really the, the New Testament as being the most esoteric document we could know. Um, and uh, that then leads us into this enormous subject of um, you know, the Catholic Church. We got him as after, of course, the re-meeting Gurdjieff again in the, after the Second World War when they'd have this exchange. Uh, and Gurdjieff told him to, he would tell the true story of the Last Supper. This incredible thing which possessed him. And that, you know, sorry, Debbie, but then you know, just these memories come in and they're like kind of like <clears throat> exploding <laughs> together. The, this, uh, excuse me, sense. And I call it a sense it was got from him because it's to do with reading his stuff, possibly. This, oh, so unbelievable, this sense that he had that he was an eyewitness to the time of Christ. And I say this without pretending to demonstrate this or prove it in any way whatsoever, or even believe in it. But that's how it comes across as if he was witnessing it. And it's something which you find in that period after the Second World War, it's in the sense of Christianity and the New Testament, the making of the Ark. Then when it brought into it was this, this how does he have forgotten the right word for it now? There's a proper word for it, which is to do with the the future going about. And he so he picked up these scenes of, of the parousia, which means through being the, the, this permeation of everything, and the role of the Holy Ghost or the Paraclete, and that absolutely religious terms because um, Bennett just said you know, most of the Gurdjie people would have shunned religion, so this is inferior crap. Uh, but he wasn't afraid to take it on wholeheartedly, but he never thrust it upon people. And then uh, this. Because um, yeah, many people don't know what the Paraclete is or, or things like that. But you know, I, I went and studied theology, so that's why I've got an inkling. I oh, know what they oh, are, but it, it's not—it's not everyday Christian language for most people. 
No, well, most people now are just bloody ignorant. This is the age of you know freely available knowledge, but they're more ignorant than ever. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? It's very peculiar. Yeah. But that's because they think they can just go and if they need that knowledge, they'll just go and press a button and find it on Google mm -hmm. rather than well, let's go and learn. Because it also becomes is, this part of this rising tide of um, anti-intellectualism. You know, the idea you know religion, you've got to have an intellect and think. The people who look at this, you're crazy. You just got to feel right. That's all it is, it's only feeling. And um, you know, if your heart's in the right place, it's all this hard stuff. Um, of course, the traditional church, which you, if you study theology, you would have, I can't have the traditional church. You know, I struck there's a wonderful book called, I think, called The Dark God or something. It's the period of mysticism, you see, which was, in a sense, radically intellectual. There was no difference between the mystic and the theologian in the early church. They were the same people and acted in the same way as for them, no difference. And this concern with experiences was, was consciously shunned. They said experiences can be a distraction. But that was be before it all became rationalized. It was like too well, much no, rationality was... come into it when we don't need rationality to study these kind of things. Well, that's certainly true, yeah. Well, so, so I was just you know, made looking at Ben in his Gavati universe, where I talked to him, he was able, but he had a lot of practice, you know, over the years of, you know, just talking to people, giving lectures. It was just something which grows from doing a lot of it. And he, and he really well did. But, um, but um, I'll just mention in passing, the, like the first, book published by Coombe, Spr Coombe Springs was, I don't know if you know what it was, it was the collection Values. It was an anthology of pieces from different traditions, Taoism, there's Keats in there, Meister Eckhart, um, but also for us like David Hume is in there. And as a testament itself, so remarkable, I was very glad when Ben Bennett actually got around to republishing it. I don't suppose many people bothered to get it, but it, you read that, you can also read um, Bennett's mind and what it was like. And that was in the 1940s, he produced this. It was, it was you see, it was, you know, it was taken from all these places. It wasn't just about Gurdjieff and so on. He started with this world picture, you know, all these incredible people. I think things from the Mahabharata, I can't remember all the details of it now. That's it's been quite a year with only people, he must have this republished again and wanted to do it. So he did that. And then to bring these big themes and then here I am really making a goulash of all this conversation and just throwing more and more ingredients in, so to speak. <laughs> I think we have to oh do another God. show on it, maybe. <laughs> maybe, I mean, I'll yeah. pick up the pieces afterwards because this is what I'm very concerned with, with this work with Joseph, as he's about writing the work, like the work of Ben in what he is. And, not to do it as a hagiography in order to blabbing about how wonderful he was and holy. Because I another anecdote coming up morning saying, well, that is when working on a pond that Coombe Springs and he turned up, I still remember this in his underpants, which were brightly colored. And <laughs> talking, to, talking to us about holy men. <laughs> and he said, um, at one point, I remember two bits of it. One was it, um, he said, um, maybe I'm a holy man, he said. And he said, well, you know, what is a holy man is someone who can enter into the different worlds at will. That was already incredible and informative. Then he said, but he added, but you know, holy men can make mistakes. They do, because they're not perfect. They're not perfect, but they're often treated as perfect. Yeah. So you, people lose their discrimination. You see, but it, it was a very important part of my life with Bennett to learn this about standing by your own judgment. It might make you feel alone or doubting. Because there was a side, I mentioned doubt of Bennett, which people won't believe in. You know, he apparently at times, and he's, like any real person, a mess of contradictions. He really was unsure of himself. He lacked confidence. You think Bennett lacked confidence? 
but he did um, remember this conversation with him at Sherborne. I don't know why he said it. I said, um, Mr. Bennett, um, I feel so wretched. I feel I'm so nothing. And of course, being Bennett, what did he do? He said, oh yeah, I know what you mean. I said, so I wake up at three o'clock in the morning just so aware of my sins. <laughs> uh, then he said, he always had this twinkle. But he, said, but he said, you must never let it cramp your style. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Make it your own style. <laughs> Don't well, follow someone else's. <laughs> no, you cannot. You see, uh, this is this doubt. It is this conformity, joining, groupthink, all that. But that's um. um well, we got to almost two hours here. But where could we leave it? So kind of to summarize it. Maybe it's right enough to leave it on. Fulfilled. It's uh... well. This is it. This is for now for the people to go forward and find Mr. Bennett's writings themselves, or Mr. Gurdjieff's, or your own, and continue their own paths and learn from. Uh, I, I feel these people, like Mr. Bennett, Mr. Gurdjieff, uh, and such like, they're there to, to guide us. They're not the be all and the end all, but they they had the wise words to help us. Us. There's a kind of semi awful and semi humorous thing to take on this. It's a thing from the Gurdjieff pronouncement, you know, the work is against nature, is against God. You see, and I thought quite rapidly my response was, yeah, it's against you too. <laughs> <laughs> it's against Gurdjieff and Bennett. If you and I don't know who said it, it's one of those um Asian Wise guys, you know, if you meet Buddha on the path, kill him. You know that one? Yeah, I know that one. I've never quite been able to, I've thought about it often, I still don't quite. The teacher gets in the way. Oh, okay. Right. It's, 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 um, but you need the teacher for a while, and then when you've had it, when it's, yeah. when it, yeah, you yeah. must, like what you was discussing before, people wanted to keep it the same all the time instead of moving on to the next step. Yeah. I've been yeah. arguing, you know, this, you see, you, you know, it's like, it's to do with the will. If you get in this will orientation of being a follower, you always follow. Yeah, you'll never be yourself. Right, you always mm. follow. It's a contamination. And you get this hint of it, you know, of Beelzebub himself, this wonderful mythology of Beelzebub. A bright upstart who questions his endlessness. You're not running the universe right, you know. <laughs> he gets banished, you see, and and, and and all of that. But it's a wonderful mythology, because unless you kick the traces, you're not worth anything. It's the only. It's like the only real believers are the blasphemers. The rest are just la di da, <laughs> you know. They don't really care about it, take it seriously, because if they took it seriously, they could start blaspheming and mean it. Uh, you, this is very, um, you've got to be able to do this. Like my old friend, I don't know if you ever met him, John Kirby, who died last year, suffered cancer for some many years, and was a very devout a lover, particularly of Mary, and he would um, tell me about how he'd sometimes curse and rail at God, you know, there's pain he was suffering, he wanted to be healed and um, you've got to, because this means taking God seriously and most people these days don't, you know, it's like when I was, I, I felt proud to see when I was in school and so on, I was this, the acme of atheism, I stood out, you know, I'm the leader of atheism in school, you know, I, thought, well, I can remember how it all started in assembly in the Lord's Prayer and I suddenly like, hang on, hang on, this isn't working, you know, <laughs> what, 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 what is this, you know, I became an atheist. And I think uh, for me, uh, I always make it a stupid rule, amazing, any, any true Christian must be an atheist because otherwise a Christianity is too pathetic 
<laughs> Too easy, I know. There's a woman minister I heard on the radio once, and she was a music program talking about music she liked, and she said something about it. And he said, Oh, you're, you're a person of faith, son. And, um, and she said, oh, What for you is the opposite of that? Uh, the doubting, and she said, Do you doubt? And Mr. said, Of course I doubt, you know, and the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's belief. Uh, it's a you know, play on words, perhaps you, you get it, but it's this, you, know, you know, I think most people don't, wouldn't realize that um, doubt and questioning are not antithetical to faith, but the very ground of faith. Well, when you doubt, you start to question, and when you start to question, you start to get answers of a kind that hopefully will yeah. take you in the way you want to go. <laughs> it's like, um, here I have another story, but this time from the Matnawi, one of my favorite ones, the one where the uh, that it came up with uh, his uh, actual experience of my friend in Tabashi about this. And then, Praying Allah, Allah, you see, in Iblis, who is a name for the, the devil, speaks to the man and said, Oh man, what are you doing? And I said, I'm praying, brother. And he said, But my dear man, have you ever had an answer? And I said, well, 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 mean answer? I don't really expect an answer. He said, No, this is, seems to be your undertaking is uh, unintelligent, is, is to cannot. What's the point? What are you doing? And the man is plunged into doubt and confusion and sorrow. Of course, it's like something out of comics, you know, pops this other character, the green one. You know the green one? Yes, yes. You know his name? Well, I thought that was Iblis as well. Pardon? I thought that was Iblis as well. The no, no. No, Iblis is the devil. No, the green one is Hitter. It's Hitter. K H I D R, Hitter. And he is the one, the green one, the mortal one, who is, and he appears in the Quran, who is the inner teacher, so that all innovations in the spiritual tradition are ascribed to Hitter. But he says to him, O oh, foolish man, you did not understand that your prayer was being answered already. You, by yourself, would not utter the word Allah. When you cry Allah, it is Allah who is crying the name, and he is present. I think this is absolutely wonderful and it goes to when I was actually talking to Tavishir about it yesterday and experience when I was very young and with a girlfriend or something and listening to the music of Thomas Tallis and I was a very spiritual guy and I said I really have this burning question you know do I have a soul you know, I was that sort of guy a geek if you like and then she said said ah uh, you had a soul when you ask that question. I, that was genius. Absolute genius. This is how it is. You, talk, you talked about teachers and so on, but the, I think the, it's the, I'm just, and I'm saying pesiting though, because you know, there's like firing synapses going on in me and different memories and so on, but it's like the, taking, as I often have the virtuous books as a metaphor for transformation, there's an all and everything, which is like, say, Bennett's dramatic universe and so on, you do all that. Um, but the second series of writings, which is there to show the real world, you know, something of the real world, and what it's based on, it's based on dialogue, on friendship. And he meets up with these remarkable men, they give him some information, 
but the core of it is meetings with remarkable men. And I was critique or you see, in the description remarkable because they have worked objectively or have a good old age or something like that. And I say, no, they are remarkable because they can actually work together. <laughs> Yes. and treat each other as equals. Mm -hmm. And he emphasized you know, how different they are, Pagasia and Skridloff, and Rich Kaya. What a horde of characters, you know, and sort of messed up totally by the stupid film made by the Foundation about it. Um, um, he, and who knows what the third series would be, which has countenance as Gurdjieff's contribution to the Western tradition of the confession, right? Confessions of Augustine, of St. Augustine, this kind of thing, and Montaigne. Yeah. But to go so that you can hear your neighbor, as I say, the, as the fourth way is anything, it should, my should, enable you to learn from anybody. And all this having a special te teacher or knowing some special piece of knowledge is so much garbage. Because it's like the, you talk to us about relationship to art, you stand in front of it, you know, and it's, it's you are, it's, it's the most precious thing you are going to see, you are going to hear. Uh, without this, it's like all the music is nothing without the audience. <laughs> nothing. Uh, this is this is so true, and so us, and so it's all for us. It's like the Sabbath is made for us, not being made for the Sabbath, not to keep the system going. But you see, so I rail against this a narrow-mindedness sticking to the Gurdjieff canon and the Gurdjieff language and so on. <clears throat> so I feel, I'm trying to summarize this up, I'm desperately trying to be good. Forgive me, Debbie. That's okay. Yeah. But we yeah. are going to have to end soon. <laughs> I know that I'm trying to get this sort of wrap up <laughs> thing about it. You know, so, uh, I think better represented um, transition. And there's much to be gained by reflecting on what he did and said and shared, so to speak. But he was like a watershed or a in between from old age and new age, if you think, or epochs, if you think in, in those terms. And I think that in a way, and then it takes me back to Mandel's anecdote about this marvelous man, Henry Boyce, who incidentally was a friend of Benjamin Britten. And he talked to me, played to me good his music, which I didn't appreciate at the time at all. And he was going on about the period of teachers being over, and this may seem a shallow idea. But I think anything it is, I, for myself, for all these last decades, as I've been getting older, I always cheered about hearing about the deaths of the golden oldies. You know? I would agree with that. We're coming into the end of the age of Pisces, which was the year of the age of teachers. And we've really? got all them teachers to learn from. And we're going into the age of Aquarius. And the age of Aquarius is all about the individual. So we've got the teachers to learn from, from Pisces. And then from them, we go forward. Yeah. But that's what is the, the shape of this new world, I feel. I was going apologizing and using the word subjective. In, but the, the meaning of what? subjectivity and objectivity has changed over the last few hundred years and it almost turned into the opposite. But if the, uh, there is this, this, this possibility of access to things which 50, 100 years ago were only attainable by a lot of effort and sacrifice and are now almost free. But it's needed now as an acceptance of um, yeah, which reminds me of one of Bennett's grand claims in the nomadic universe. He said this last 2000 years have been marked by an extraordinary phenomena, namely that man has not accepted the gift of his salvation. 
you know. And I can never say it to you at this moment because it, what comes out of my mouth, what comes out of my mouth is that uh, me, the essence of the, that was promised in the fourth way and so on, is to accept of salvation. And it was contrary to what appears. You know, it's all about this and so on. Yet another story from Bennett to throw an anecdote at time when he really announced him getting free of Gurdjieff. And he said, well, Gurdjieff says, man does not have an eye, but can get one. Get one. I, Bennett, say, man does not have an eye and cannot get one. <laughs> There's no hope. Not at all. There is hope. Yeah. You've got to get it, sister. You've got to get what it's really about, you see. So maybe all of the good of canon is a out of date mythology. Who knows? And we are frightened about the new age with this um, emotional leather. Oh. And also, lunatics like your favorite David Icke. Um, the, this thing about acceptance, and that's what I really want to share with people most about Bennett, his journey, uh, which going through these realities which then emerged in what appears to be just the books like The Sevenfold Work, uh, which gave a totally different new perspective on the Gurdjieff work, which he did. He, he produced this amazing difference because it's about what is the work about. So we come down to the, um, our little performance of the new design, which is what all that was about. It's the... Um, which is coming soon for people to see. Yeah, <laughs> not to see, you don't see it. Yeah, which is the, uh, all about the merciful force of the Okidanoch, and, uh, and, uh, which I'm, I really appreciate. I may think it's something, as you see, you, it's not doing what you like, it's not a free for all, it's not being lazy, it's not being stupid and all that sort of thing, but we know that all these, whatever you do, the efforts of this, that, and the error, and fasting yourself to death, or reading 20,000 books, or whatever it is, it, uh, it doesn't really change you, but the the change begins to come, then all of that stuff is different. It changes. And you you see something which some spiritual leaders have described in the most irritating fashion. Yeah. They, they say, oh, it's just so simple, so easy. And you want to go, oh, it's easy for you, brother. You ain't got my problems and my, my hangouts, you know. You know. No, but they're actually the right, but they find this different way of saying it without saying it. Uh, you know what I mean? And so I think that um, art is a probably a better way than teaching. Mm. Yeah. It's another way, I believe, yes. That's more appropriate because you, most people can't stomach religion anymore. Um, but they might come out to my favorite fantasies, you know. They might tune into summertime. <laughs> <laughs> Which we're going to talk about sometime too. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your patience, Debbie, because I do, you know, you set me off on this path. You see, it's all. There's a lot to it. As, as every life story has a lot to it. So, you know, we, we can do more another time. I really appreciate everything you said tonight. It's been a real, I've been a thrill of a ride to hear all about this and to learn so much of 
Mr. Bennett's life and your own experience with him, with him. And obviously you've, you've um, helped with his books over the years, which people can still get um, yeah, through your website. Right. So well, I would like to thank you very much, Tony, for everything you've said tonight. And I look forward to doing more with you. Well, bless you, dear, because you're one well, of my companions in all this, I feel. And, and, uh, I feel yeah. the same way. I do enjoy our talks. And, you know, when we meet up and everything else, it's just been great. Oh, when I first saw you and your puppets in America, oh, yeah. talking about Tesla, oh, yeah, yeah, she's got something, this girl, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's all, for me, fun to do as well, but... That's it, what you say these days, Debbie, you know, the bottom line is have fun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is absolutely that's true, what, which many people that's are like... That's the minimum <laughs> requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, F-U-N comes first. And it's been fun with you. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I'm going to press stop. All right, all right. Thank so you good. very much. No.